What up, Player Profiler Nation? It's Maddie Kiwum. Welcome to the latest episode of The Game Plan. First and foremost, please subscribe to the Player Profiler YouTube channel. And while you're at it, take a minute and absolutely destroy that like button. And finally, write in the comments, what topics would you like me and a guest to talk about for the rest of the offseason? Just go ahead and leave that in the comments. Today's show, however, is going to be the best. And the emphasis on best was for a reason, because today, well, we're talking about best ball again. So gang, get out your pens and your pads, and let's start game planning to take down some best ball contests. Planners, today's guest is one of the brightest in the best ball space. He is the host of Best Bell Fantasy Football, which you can find right here on the Roto Underworld Network each and every Tuesday night. You've seen him on shows like Mind of Mansion, Man vs. Machine, and now The Game Plan. So everyone, please give it up. For my man, Bradley Stalder. What's going on, my man? Maddie, it's great to be on the game plan this evening. I'm honored that you would invite me. It's uh, been a lot of fun since I've been in the pre- player profiler streets. So I'm honored to oh, yeah. be here with you tonight. We've had some great additions to the fam, but I mean, you are at the top of that list. Your prowess in best ball and your willingness to let a, let somebody know when they're not all that good at it, they can use that as motivation to get better. And um, for people who don't may not be familiar, Bradley, do you want to let them know on what happened? I think it was your inaugural episode. It, it was. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the Best Bell channel, uh, the Best Bell uh, podcast, um, it airs every Tuesday, as Maddie said, 8 to 9 p.m. And generally there have been three segments in this podcast. The first is we would talk about risers and fallers in the underdog streets. Um, Use the promo code underworld, by the way, if you are a first time user. Then the second part is I would teach like a lesson or I would go into some strategy or I would ask a guest some questions. So there would be some learning that would be happening, uh, like knowledge content wise. Mm -hmm. And then the third part, uh, this is where where Maddie and I kind of uh, got off to an interesting start. Maddie submitted, <laughs> Maddie submitted a team to me, and I was uh, I was a tough grader. I think that's brutally I honest at. would be how I would uh, say that. <laughs> I was a I was a tough grader for it, and but you know what? Part of part of this process is just continuing to get better. And that's why Maddie's one of the best in the industry as well is because to be the best, and this isn't just best ball, you know, the, the puns will continue to fly <laughs> throughout, throughout the, the night to be the best though. You have to continue to refine your process. Like even just tonight, 10 minutes before I hopped on with Maddie, um, one of the best in the biz outside of player profiler is Dwayne McFarland out of Matthew mm-hmm. Berry's oh, fancy sure. life. He is an absolute stud. Um, and so I have great respect for him in the fantasy space and he would get, he actually got into a, uh, discussion with David Kluge about the Houston backfield and they were going back and forth and back and forth. And David just said, you are one of the best people to disagree with because you don't like go below the belt, Dwayne. And Dwayne replied, like, look, I've been wrong so many times. I've just been refining my process. And like, as fantasy players, I think that's the attitude we want to just continue to take is what is something that we can learn? How can we make changes and how can we become better players based on new information or information that maybe we look at it a different way and that's going to give us better insight. So um, Maddie was given some insight into his team <laughs> and, uh, and he said he's been drafting better. So, yes. you know, maybe Maddie will have to, we'll have to have a combo combo episode here coming up in the in the hot best ball summer where where you can really put your uh your new talents to the test uh in real time but i'm excited to uh to dive into some best ball tonight 
Oh, I mean, I had to have you on. Last week I had Tyler Football, and we were talking about best ball fades, so a little bit more narrowed in our discussion. But I wanted to have you on for your theory, your strategies, sure. your philosophies, because I think that this is going to be good for everyone to listen to, maybe they're new to best ball, or they just haven't had a whole lot of luck. And I got to say, you are one of the best, because you were tough with your grading, but not for a second did I ever feel offended, discouraged from playing the game, or discouraged from checking out your show. So I think that if you are new to the game, and you want Bradley to, to, to give you a fair, honest, and truly uh, effective analysis of one of your teams. Send it into the show. Let him break it down. Because even if it's a bad team, he'll let you know. But I got to admit, you told me where my faults were. So I knew what I had to focus on for my next few drafts. And like I said, for, for not a millisecond was I, ah, screw this guy. I can't come back to this. No, I felt like, okay. <laughs> I got to get back into the lab, do a little something, something, get him on the game plate so I can dissect his brain, get up in the knowledge. <laughs> it's uh, it, it was a great process. It was a great uh, back and forth, especially because that theme has like interwoven the summer. This has not been the, the first time that uh, that team has ended up on the game plan. So. <laughs> <laughs> But I'm excited to get into some theory with you and to share uh, a few insights that I've gained and, and improved my play over the past couple of years when when entering the best ball streets. So, yeah, let's get into it. Well, I do have a surprise for you, Bradley, because I like to surprise or should I say flank my guests with a couple <laughs> of questions that they weren't prepared for. I'm here for it. So the first question. How long you've been playing fantasy football? And my follow-up is how would you describe your management style? I've been playing fantasy football since 2011. So it's been about 12 years. Mm -hmm. That's when my home league started in college. Um, it, one of my households from Franciscan University, Knights of the Holy Queen, we have and still have to this day, um, a, a league that goes on and that was how I got into it. And I yes. started winning and doing pretty well. And I was like, Oh, this is a lot of fun. And then in the <laughs> off season I started getting, so at that point we were just on the ESPN app. Of course. And that right. was the, yep. that was the only app that I really knew about. There was no, I didn't have a Twitter. There was nothing. It was literally, I was just playing in this one league and I was very into my home league. Of course. So, That's so your I, baby. I kept refreshing all the time. And then I was like, wait, Matthew Barry, like this guy has like videos embedded in the profiles of the players. Let me watch some of the videos. Oh, yep. wait, are there more videos? Is there like, so I found out that there's a podcast. I found there's out that there's yeah. like, there's like video record. I, I didn't know that these things existed. <laughs> <laughs> and so, and so I started like watching this and like learning more. And then like, I started like listening even during the off season. I was like, oh, okay, like, there's yep. other things that are happening like during the off season, like there are transactions, players get traded. Like, <laughs> like the draft process is pretty draft. neat here. <laughs> I had no idea. This was a whole, this was a whole new world, a whole new world for me. And so, um, yeah, I just, I kept getting better and better in mm -hmm. the home league. And then I don't know, it was like 2019, 2018, 2019 around there. I started dabbling in the dynasty streets, uh, on sleeper. Because I had thrown out, I don't know, in a, a Facebook group, like, hey, I'm interested in doing like Dynasty. Like people are talking about Dynasty leagues like these things exist. Like I watch all year long. I might as well have a team that I care about all year long. <laughs> well, like I played Madden, like my favorite oh, Madden was, yes. was Madden 2004. And it was Brett Favre throwing to Randy Moss. I would always trade for Brett Favre to Randy Moss because strongest arm to the fastest player. <laughs> That's how you dial it up. And so, like, it, he would only lose to Champ Bailey, the cornerback. Yep. That would be the only one who could defend him <laughs> in a consistent basis. So I would make sure I would have a crappy O-line. I would just drop back, like, Brett Favre, like, extra 15 yards just so that... Team step drop, yep. <laughs> <laughs> so that the offensive line didn't matter. Tony Gonzalez was just in the middle of the field if I got in trouble. And just, I chucked it, like... <laughs> Yeah, yeah, like yeah, maybe 70 yards down the field because that's what Brett Favre could do, you know. So, oh, yeah, at, at any rate, that was I, but the I, my love for like simulated games and like seeing how the process mm -hmm. worked out led me to say, hey, like I want to get into the dynasty streets from that perspective. Uh, and so I was dabbling with dynasty for a couple of years and then COVID hit, you know, in 2020. Mm -hmm. 
And I was doing well in the dynasty streets and doing well in the redraft streets and said like, Hey, like, why don't I like just try to take this to the next level? Like, obviously there are people who are starting to make content about right. this stuff. And I had no idea the depth of the con. I didn't know who JJ Zacharyson was this time. Like I didn't know Dwayne McFarland existed. Like these people who are just geniuses. And, like, exactly. Yep. Absolutely brilliant people yep. who have thought much longer than I have about this existed. And now like I, I said, you know what? I'm going to make a Twitter. I'm going to, uh, and then once I joined Twitter after a couple of weeks, like Mike Clay dropped his first set of projections and I'd been following Clay for a while and I right. respected his opinions on things uh, and players and his perspective. He was always like the Debbie downer. And I was, I thought to myself, you know, he's right more often than, than like the optimist, the other optimist on the show, uh, Daniel Dopp and Field Yates, the eternal yep. optimist. So, right. I'm, <laughs> so I was like, you know what? This guy is probably like, he makes sense. I can also do projections. I can do this. I have a math degree. Like I can handle this. Oh, I mean, you're built for this, Brad. I've got this. I'm the machine, you know, whatever. <laughs> so, so I created my first sense of I'm the machine, you know? And so I, I created my first sense of projections and I shared these in some of my dynasty leagues. And then out oh, of nowhere, cool. um, one of my league mates reached out to me and he's like, Hey, can I like make my own projections? like using your template. I'm like, sure. So I shared that with him. And then he was like, all right, give me like a couple of weeks. And so I gave him a couple of weeks and he was like, I'm done with them. Can we like talk about them uh, and like the differences? And I'm like, sure, let's do it. So we talked about it like in the sleeper DMS and, and then he was like, so how are we going to like share these thoughts with other people? And I said, well, why don't we start a podcast there it is. And that's where the Fantasy Football Fanalyst podcast with Billy Muzio started. So it was me and Billy for two years in the content streets, just like figuring out our ways. I remember our first debate was whether Dan Arnold or Max Williams was going to be the better tight end for the Arizona Cardinals. And that was like the big debate. <laughs> yes. Oh, I love the Billy Muzio origin story. And you know what's funny about that? Bradley is fast forward to what two days ago you guys are arguing about tight ends in this year's <laughs> unprojected season <laughs> there's nothing new under the sun Maddie there's nothing new it just under we the just sun. go around yeah it's all these big big laps <laughs> but oh, that's awesome to hear and yep. I mean giving it to your league mates like hey why is everyone a lot better in this dynasty league after I shared my projections is because they were probably some pretty damn good projections I must say Bradley they they ended up being uh being pretty accurate uh for a first for a first draft and then I got better the second. You just continue to improve your process and mm -hmm. and change what is viewed as important. Like one of the things that I once again I know I keep bringing him up, but Dwayne McFarland keeps he will on repeat if you follow him at all, he will say that some stats are sticky and some stats are not sticky or mm -hmm. that they are reproducible year to year and some things aren't. And so part of that is yes, like you can say like target share is pretty sticky year to year, but until you see it until right. you're like doing those projections every year and you know that your Deandre Hopkins are going to get 28 to 33% target share. Like it's just a number until you start doing those projections and, uh, and it gives you a new insight in the players. So I just finished like my first round of projections. Lord knows how many iterations I'm going to do. Yeah. Uh, but it's uh, it's definitely a grueling process, but it makes you better at play your player takes. It allows you to have a better understanding of these are the players that I'm more out on, or these mm -hmm. are the players I'm more in on. And maybe the numbers are telling me something different than like my intuition or what ADP is telling me. Right. That's something I have yet to be able to shed. My fandom is something I cannot remove from my analysis. And it's it, it does hurt me at times because there are just certain times where I just I'm about a player. I like what I see and I just can't let it. If I maybe if I did projections one day, I could be more beholden to my numbers than these players. But sometimes I see that, you know, these cards behind me, they're up there for a reason. They're some of my favorite players. So those are the guys that I I can't quit. But I do have one extra one last question. We'll get into sure. the best ball talk. 
is Billy even allowed to disagree with you? You're like the head vampire that like bit him and turned him. So does he have to? He has to, you know, kiss the ring, right? He has to bend the knee, right? Bradley, oh no, oh no! It's Billy is contractually obligated to disagree with me on everything. <laughs> so that is the deal. That is the deal. It start. It started with Dan Arnold, Max Williams, and it ended with, uh, or it's continuing on even through yesterday with Chig Conquo. The so. Chig Conquo, the Battle of Chig. That'll be the Battle of Chig 2023. I can't wait to see how that plays out and then one of you guys can go, <laughs> I told you, I told you. But I got a whole bunch of best ball questions. We're going to dive into every single one of them. So you guys are going to want to stick around for that. But before we do, let's hear from the Podfather as he breaks down FFPC Leagues. <laughs> Hey, you know, people always ask me, what's the World Series of Fantasy? What's the Super Bowl of Fantasy? And it's easy. It's the FFPC. Their signature Players Championship has a $6 million prize pool. And their best ball leagues start in February. And they're the answer to so many questions. Hey, what's the best place to get a Dynasty Orphan? Well, you can adopt a Dynasty Orphan at the FFPC right now. There's more orphans at the FFPC than anywhere else on the internet. That's why we partner with them. So if you want to play fantasy football for low, medium, high stakes, you love Dynasty, you love best ball, you love seasonal leagues, all types of fantasy footballers need to go to the FFPC and remember... Use promo code UNDERWORLD. Promo code UNDERWORLD gets you $25 off your first team. Promo code UNDERWORLD, $25 off your first team, no matter what the format is, at the FFPC. Go get it. Use that promo code UNDERWORLD on FFPC, whether you want to start some best ball teams or pick up an orphan for Dynasty Leagues. FFPC, that's where it's at. If you're a high-stakes player, head on over there, and you can play with the big dogs for the big bucks. Bradley, first question. So this is going to be, we're starting on ground, maybe not even ground level. This might be parking level. This might be below the lobby in terms of beginner question. What's your preferred platform for best ball drafts? I typically play on four different sites and I'm limited in some places. So when I travel out of state, like I can, I can draft on some more, but I primarily right, right. draft on, on FFPC, you know, our, our partner here use promo code underworld of $25 off your first team. There you go. Um, <laughs> He's I a got company the, man. I've got Shout the line out. Down. Let's go. <laughs> I, I draft on drafters which is available here in Michigan. They've got um, $20 entries. They've got uh, $3 entries. Uh, it's full PPR and it's season long. So the drafters is not like a, uh, a playoff tournament. It's a season long tournament. So that's better for your long-term player takes versus uh, like for underdog. We'll get to the underdog next for underdog. That's more of a tournament setting Right, where you're you're trying to correlate and stack for week 17. That's the highest EV. We'll get into all of that, but use promo code Underworld on Underdog as well for a hundred dollar de- uh, first time deposit match. There it is. So there you go. Uh, and so make sure you're you're checking out Drafters FFPC Underdog DraftKings has a lot of different levels stakes as well. And I'll share just just for a moment. I fell into a Dallas Goddard stack because Goddard fell 13 spots after ADP and I oh. had AJ Brown as well. And it was like a full, like <laughs> a, a beautiful moment. It was one of those, like yeah. where in a tet in the game of Tetris, like the, the line just like when it knocks out. off six yeah. rows. Boom, 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 boom. <laughs> it was boom, beautiful. Boom. Yeah. Like it got the player take, it got the value. It got the stack. It got everything that I wanted so right. you're that is that's luck, but it also allows you to to be a little unique. And I I didn't have to reach for him. Mm-hmm. Um, so those are primarily the four places that I draft. Uh, Underdog, of course, is limited in Michigan. So when I travel to see my family in Ohio, that's when I do some of my under, underdog drafts. <laughs> yeah, baby. And you know, if you're a first timer, ch- check out one of those platforms. Uh, see how you like it because the it, I mean it is a different feel, right? When you're doing your season yes. on drafters, or if you're doing the tournament style, right? It, that's a little bit different approach, different kind of way to jump into the waters, right? Or is it kind of consistent? Uh, so FFPC, it can be. I mean, the there's thirty five dollars is I think the lowest. 
right, entry. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's going to be higher than your best ball mania four entries or a lot of your DK entries or any of your drafters. There's also a $125 FFPC best ball tournament. Um, and as an aside, I was invited for the first time this year to the pros versus Joe's best ball tournament. I saw that yep. FFPC. So that's a, a really exciting shout out to uh, fantasy mojo, Darren Armani, who runs that. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and so I just want to also take a moment and say, thanks Darren for the invite. I'm, uh, I'm going to uh, come away victorious. So let it, <laughs> let it be known. Thanks, that, thanks that for me, pros... but not for everyone else. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so first time and the winner of the pros versus Joe's best ball tournament, uh, you have to be invited to that one, or you have to be entering into a main event, which is a $2,000 entry. So right. I was invited. Um, but if you win your league, you get a free entry to the main event the next year. Oh, wow. Okay. So if any of you, any of you listeners has some deep pockets, want to get a little crazy with it, there you go. You could go as much or as little as you kind of want as you get into these best ball streets. Next question I want to ask you, it's kind of another general question. So it's for the people who are just starting drafting these best ball teams. What are some of the keystone differences between drafting a best ball team and your typical redraft seasonal team? Yeah, and this is a common question. I, I was just DM'd today privately on Twitter. Like, hey, I see like you're talking about best ball. I've been watching your stuff on Player Profiler. Like, make sure you guys are subscribing to the YouTube channel. There's a lot of great content, not just best ball content on here. But one of the guys reached out to me privately and he's like, Hey, can you tell me a little bit more about best ball? Like what's the differences? And mm -hmm. I said, number one, there's no trades. You can't trade with anybody. So you can't finagle your way out of a bad draft. You can't like, you can't just plow your way through. <laughs> yeah, there's no, like there's no like trading your future first, like move up or there's yeah. no like trading to two for one and like the fourth and the seventh round to get a first another first round. There's nothing like that. You're not going to be able to like out mind game somebody or out negotiate somebody in the trade streets. <laughs> there's no way. I love those either so there's no fab bidding mm -hmm. for players you get the team that you get too bad so sad like if you construct your team in a certain way that's how it's going to be for the season you are stuck with the players that you draft and you have to deal with bye weeks because there's no waivers there's no trades so you're just gonna have to take the lumps with the bye weeks but so will everyone else in your league right right there is an even playing field on that front the best ball takes exactly what it sounds like the best scores that fill your starting lineup. So for underdog, you start a quarterback, two running backs, three wide receivers, a tight end and a flex play. I believe that's eight starting positions and there's 18 rounds in the best ball mania for mm -hmm. draft. So there's going to be 10 players who don't make your lineup eight that do. And the best scores that fill your lineup, will go into each week's score and there's a running count of the best scores each week. If you win your, if you win your, your league, then you move on in the underdog streets to the tournament. But if it's in drafters, for instance, that's season long, there's a tally of, you know, how many points okay. you've scored each week and there's no tournament. Uh, it's just one weeks one through 17. So it just depends on where you're at and, and what platform you're drafting on. Um, there's a little bit of strategy, different strategy there, um, but that is that is best ball in a nutshell. Right. Well, so I guess my follow-up question I would ask, this is for someone new, mm -hmm. uh, you know, would you recommend someone... I, I know the terms portfolio, you know, a lot of like the financial terms have crept into fantasy and best ball, especially, but is it important for newbies like myself and others who are kind of getting new to the, the best ball contest to draft with a little bit of volume? Because if you, you know, can't make pickups, you can't make trades. It feels like it's not as fun to draft one team. If you just have all the bad luck on this one team, it's kind of, kind of make you go, Oh, this stinks. So do you recommend, you know, maybe not going crazy, but, putting a bunch of rosters together just to kind of hedge that bad luck uh, possibility. You know, some drafters do have this. I want a portfolio. I want to have the, I want to cap my exposure to a particular player exposure, at a yep. certain percentage. Some drafters do that. 
And I think that's a pretty smart thing to do because it does limit your risk to a player getting injured or suspended or or any number of things that can happen throughout the mm-hmm. season. A benching. I mean, players get demoted all the time. Oh, um, yeah. Offensive schemes. Or maybe it's indirectly. Like, if Matthew Stafford goes down, like, we saw how the Rams operated post-Matthew Stafford. I mean, we saw mm-hmm. how they operated pre, like, with Matthew Stafford last year. That wasn't when Matthew's great. elbow, when his elbow <laughs> decided to give out, it went one right. way. When he was off the field altogether, it still had a ways to go down. Right. So you've got to live with your lumps. You've got to live with with that. But there's there's pros and cons to that. The the pro for a portfolio is certainly that you're limiting your exposure. The con Mm -hmm. is that. Like if you have a correct player take, you're limiting your exposure to being right on that player. So one example is one of my friends in the industry, Felix Castro, he ended up winning. Um one of the best ball million uh, challenges on DK. He he, really great guy. He's actually doing a live draft right now, 25 hour straight live stream of just best ball drafting, which is, which is wild. Uh, He's great. But one of the things he did was he drafted like 60% Najee Harris that year. And like, (laughs) (laughs) because that was, that must have been his rookie year. That was the guy he had pushed all of his chips in on Mm -hmm. and said, you know what? I'm just going to be overexposed to this player. I'm going to rotate through all the others, but the centerpiece to my build is going to be Najee Harris. And I mean, he ended up winning. Correct. Yeah. Like it, like he did well enough with that pick and whatever else he, he rotated through to get that build that won him the million dollars. So there are different ways to win. It it just depends on how you want to play the game and right, what, what right. your risk tolerance is with drafting either low or high volume. Okay. That's it that makes sense. So you don't have to necessarily throw a hundred teams out there, but you know, there is some extra strategy involved when you can kick up the volume a little bit because you can protect yourself from some things. Or you, if you go all in on the right guy, Apparently win a million dollars. So shout out Felix if you uh, if you want to kick some cash my way, you know maybe maybe, maybe I, won't, I won't say no. I won't say no. You talked about Dallas guard landing yeah. the dirty bird, the fly eagles fly stack. Now I highly doubt that anyone listening here doesn't know what this means, but just in case we have a a brand new best baller in the mix, what is stacking? Stacking is pairing a quarterback with a pass catcher of the same team. So typically a wide receiver or a tight end. Occasionally you can refer to the stack for the running back position, but I typically don't unless that running back is profiled as a receiving back. Mm -hmm. So it is something like that. Your Ecklers, your McCaffrey's you Mm -hmm. can view a stack that way, but I wouldn't consider like an, a Patrick Mahomes, Isaiah Pacheco stack. I wouldn't call it that right, because right. Pacheco is not profiled as a as a pass catcher. He's going to get the majority of his fantasy points independent directly of Patrick Mahomes' success. Right, right. So the, the idea of stacking is to double up your, your output. Mahomes it's, throws three touchdowns, two of them go to Kelsey. It's a windfall day if you have that stack. It's reducing what you as the drafter need to get right. Because as as I mentioned earlier, if you're right about Najee Harris and you've got 60% exposure, that means your teams are probably lifted up pretty highly relative to the field because the field only had 8%, 12%, whatever percent of Najee Harris, 25% max. Mm -hmm. Like, So if you have the stack and the stack is correct, not only do you have, are you elevated versus the field, but you also have filled two spots in your lineup that you've gotten right. Mm -hmm. So we're looking for, you know, you said eight in underdog in the stack. If in this instance, you might get the Bonanza days, you might get three, right? And you have the AJ Brown and the Dallas Goddard linked up with Jalen Hurts. He right. goes bananas. They're on the other side of it. Now you have three spots. Only five of them have any bit of, uh, you then know, I only down, need really five spots left right. to get right. And I'll take a step back. I've been doing fantasy football rankings for a couple years now on fantasy pros. And I've been doing projections. Number one for week 17, 2021, baby. Let's, let's go. go. When week let's 17 go. matters, call me up. 
call me up. Uh, oh, yeah. But, <laughs> but r- real talk, projections and rankings are really tough to get correct. Are really tough to get the right, mm-hmm. get them exactly correct, to be exactly precise. And so we want to limit the amount that we need to get right. And that's why stacking is a valuable tool because not only is it an elevator and an escalator, but it limits the other stuff that you might need to get right in the rest of your lineup. So it sounds pretty important. So I'm not going to ask you the question, is it important? It's very well, important. Well, 80, but... 80, 90%. Per- uh, what was it? Uh, in Mike Leone, who's going to be a guest this next week on the Best Bell Fantasy Show. Check uh, it out. Mike, Mike Leone of Established the Run. He wrote mm-hmm. a Ball manifesto, and he said 80% of people who are drafting have some sort of stack already when they're drafting. So mm-hmm. they're prob- you guys are probably stacking already. But what's going to be most important and a differentiator, uh, I'm looking at the show, show sheet, uh, is what's going to come next here. So y'all are probably already stacking, but what's next is going to be really important. Okay, so we'll, we'll move on to the next question. But before I do, I, I got to let everyone okay. check out this. No. Bradley, you just did a, a really awesome uh, video for Player Profiler for under-the-radar stacks. So if you want to get into the nitty-gritty of what players to stack, which ones that will really be beneficial to your best ball builds, check out that video. That's on the, the Player Profiler YouTube channel, uh, under-radar stacks. So check that out immediately after this show and really get your best ball brain on that nuclear status, that galactic best ball brain, which I am now on because I am associated with the guy who created the machine that is Billy Muzio. <laughs> so this is all working out for you, boy. I, I, I'm feeling like this is the best Let's information go. I've gotten. So the next question is, can you explain to me, this is honestly, this is going to, I'm genuinely curious because I hear it yeah. a lot, kind of know what it means, but would love to hear it from one of the best in the biz. Can you explain to me what correlation means? Yes. It is related outcomes that are not directly, but indirectly related to what's actually happening. So and let me use an example. Okay. You are, let's talk week 17, because mm-hmm. this is going to give context. The Cleveland Browns are hosting the New York Jets. And Garrett Wilson is going off for 130 yards, and he has a touchdown. Aaron Rodgers has thrown for 275 yards. He's thrown for two touchdowns. You've got the Rodgers stack. You've got the Garrett Wilson stack. Uh, Rodgers, Garrett Wilson together. Great. Yep. The, You've the, got, the nice you stack. filled yep. your, you filled your lineup. That's a really good stat line. You know, 130 plus touchdown. We're talking, uh, uh, yeah, 19 points plus whatever half PPR. So we're talking 20 plus points. He's mm-hmm. wide receiver one for the week. In that same game, it is most likely that the Cleveland Browns are going to need to try to catch up. If Aaron okay, Rodgers right, is, right. if Aaron Rodgers is throwing, let's say not two, but let's say three touchdowns. Let's say say he throws three touchdowns. The points are stacking up for the Jets. The points are stacking up for the Jets, but in real life, the Cleveland Browns are feeling the pressure to score, mm-hmm. so they're probably going to be passing the ball to keep up with the Jets in this game script, which means that it's going to be Amari Cooper or it's going to be Elijah Moore, or it's going to be David Njoku. Maybe it's Nick Chubb. It's probably not Nick Chubb because of that game environment. Mm-hmm. I mean, Nick Chubb's going to be a good pick in best ball regards. I'm I'm big Nick Chubb guy. <laughs> Nick but... Chubb. I am. I, I was a little bit, you know, my dynasty brain said sell Nick Chubb because he's so, uh, you know, between the tackles, rushing the ball dominant. And they did, but they didn't bring in a, a, another running back. And they keep saying he's, they're going to chuck the rock. Maddie. And he's built different. And, the thing about Chubb is, even and this is the game that always pops into my brain. It was Dolphins Browns, absolute mm. bonanza shootout. Yep. Everyone scored. Nick Chubb got his because I think he had a sixty-yard touchdown run. Plus, he went bananas. So, yeah, it could be Nick Chubb. But I understand what you're saying. That is so that, it's so, most likely to be one of the pass catchers, though. Right? Okay. Because when of the, the higher scoring, or the highest scoring. Okay. So this concept of correlation is related to, but not directly to the outcome. Mm-hmm. So we're probably banking on, maybe it's Amari Cooper. Maybe it's David Njoku. But what uh, Mike Leone in his Best Ball Manifesto found 
was that in week 17, correlation is really important because elite teams were doing that. Uh, they were, they had 33 to 50% of their entire roster correlated in games that played each other. Mm. So they dra- their builds were revolved around this week 17 matchup. Well, maybe it was a couple matchups. Maybe it was two matchups. And so they had, a, you know, your, your two quarterbacks stacked with a player and then one bring back. So we're talking mm-hmm. about six players out of 18. That's 33% of your entire roster that you've drafted in two games. Mm-hmm. So you're betting on, by drafting these players, that these are the two game environments that are going to get it for me. So an example of correlation this past year was Pat Corrine's $2 million winner had Tom Brady stacked with Chris Godwin. Brady threw for over 300 yards. He threw for three touchdowns. None Mm -hmm. of them went to Godwin, unfortunately. They all went to Mike Evans, right? But Godwin still had over 100 receiving yards in that game. Mm -hmm. And then the comeback around, the correlation piece, the comeback the bring back player was DJ Moore who had six catches for a hundred yards and a touchdown. Mm -hmm. So it was that game environment. And that was the third highest scoring game of the week was this Tampa Bay Carolina game. So Pat Corrine, one of the big pieces of that build was getting that game environment, right? Not just having Tom Brady, not just having Chris Godwin, but also having DJ Moore as the bring back. Is now so is the week seventeen is the importance of it the fact that it's the end of the year, or is it that typically at the end of the year these teams are playing for something so that there's you know is the I don't know if there's necessarily statistics out there that say that these shootouts because they're usually divisional matchups uh, they're usually teams trying to get in the playoffs or get the seeding so there's a little extra oomph in terms of the players themselves or is that the importance of week seventeen because that's when the dollars are on the line for us fantasy managers. It's when the dollars are on the line. Okay. There's a tremendous, um, I don't have the number offhand, but once you get into week 15 and 16 for the underdog, Best Ball Mania 4, the expected value, like if you can get out of, if you can win your initial league mm-hmm. and then advance after the first round, you're going to be making a lot of money regardless of where it where it lands on, on right. the variance of, of how things happen. We can't predict. It's going to be December 31st, week 17. <laughs> yeah. It's July 7th right now. And we, we already have like our first initial lines of what the game environment totals are. Like, uh, for instance, I'm targeting a lot of Dallas, Detroit. That's one of the highest projected game totals for week 17 this year. So I've got a lot of CD lamb with the bring back of them. I'm Ross St. Brown or vice versa. Right. Right. And let me ask you this too about correlation. If we're trying to predict the game script, is it, it's probably risky. I would imagine, but you know, we have seen a lot of these AFC Norths, you know, really kind of drag down a lot of run. Could you correlate for the running backs of a freezing cold environment, 10 to 7 finish, 1920 style football? Or is that just not going to do it for when you're trying to win the big bucks? Yeah, that's probably not going to be the game environment that's going to get you a combined 60 plus points right. like scored in that game. So if there's limited points in the game from NFL teams, you're probably not going to be able to access the super ceilings for multiple parts of your build. Mm-hmm. It, yeah. We want those indoor games, arena football shootouts, I mean, hundred points. Detroit 50-50. is going to Dallas. Green Bay is going to Minnesota in a dome. Like those are definitely things that you have to keep in mind. Yeah. I, uh, I'm struggling with the the New York Jets Cleveland one because I like a lot of players in that matchup, right. but it's going to be in Cleveland. And if you remember Week 17 of last year, it was like a Taysom Hill rushing game. It, it was a real right. nasty game. Yeah, I, Kamara was saved by a, you know a touchdown, but he didn't really get firing. And what really comes to mind is you know the, remember that Bills Bears game? I think it was what Week 15 or 16 where it was like. Can can Josh Allen cut the wind? He did. It was just all the Dawson Knox, nothing right. to Stefan Diggs whatsoever. So right. we're not looking for drag them out. So we're looking for high game totals, 
a lot of fantasy points, a lot of NFL points, quarterbacks, receivers, tight ends, bam, bam, bam. We want those high things, uh, uh, high point totals for correlation. Right. Uh, so that makes that makes total sense. Uh, that's something that I didn't know uh, previous to checking out Best Bell. So that's something I've been uh, a whole lot more excited about. And now all of a sudden, it's like week 17 matchups. Detroit Cowboys. You mentioned the uh, the Browns Giants. I I have some Chargers Broncos. Oh, we give me all the Chargers Broncos. That's what I'm saying, baby. So it's like, yeah, you Chiefs, start learning Chiefs these Bengals. I mean, that's the number right. one, right? And that's I mean the, the NFL chef's kiss. Thank you for catering to the people who pay your bills. Give us these games in Week 17. We don't need them in Week 8, baby. We want them in Week 17 because we want that correlation, those those big big scoring out, outputs. So we talked about stacking important we talked about correlation especially for week 17 very important now the next thing i want to ask you how important is it for us drafters to kind of comply with the platform's adp should we be reaching to get our guys should we stick to the top of the queues on underdog or drafters or ffpc how important is it to to comply with the the, the adp it depends on the tournament you're in if you are in a very large tournament like, let's say you are drafting in the Best Ball Mania 4 tournament. There's 650,000 expected entrants in this. Or you're in the DK tournament uh, where there's 1.1 million possible like people who are entering. Right. The, right. If you're entering to these large field tournaments, you need to stick to ADP or wait for values to come to you. It's so important to not be reaching in those tournaments because you're almost just canceling any edges that you might be getting otherwise through stacking, through actually getting your player takes right, through other <laughs> things. Because if you're reaching in those, you're saying, not only do I know better, but I, I know better enough that I can overcome other people's edges mm -hmm. in this 1.1 million tournament like the amount right. of pride the amount of hubris that exists <laughs> for you to say you know what i'm gonna reach more than a round in you know if you want to reach a couple spots in those tournaments fine if you want to go a couple spots okay like to get your stacks or or maybe you really do want to set the tone for a player or you are it, you're in the first round you're in the first round there really isn't reaching in the first round because you're getting right. your guy right especially in the first round uh, or you're setting up like i primarily want to draft wide receivers in the first round mm -hmm. so unless a nice running back from the first round falls to the second i'm probably not going to be drafting a running back you know in that spot so but from a small tournament perspective ADP out the window, like in the pros versus Joes, it's right. it's 84 teams that are totally that are being drafted in this tournament. I'm just mm -hmm. gonna get my guys at the right, right spot. Right. I'm You're gonna, gonna trust get your my, projections because they guys, may yeah. not be back because other people also realize that this is a turn a small tournament right. where you got to get your guys. So <laughs> <laughs> you see so, those light bulbs going off. You're like. Oh, uh, shit. I, gotta, I uh, need this right, to get back to me now. Right, 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 right. So <laughs> Tony Pollard, come on, come on, Tony. <laughs> please, please come back to me. And also stacking is not as important in those small tournaments. That's one okay. of the things that I was talking with Todd Burroughs about. In these extremely large tournaments, like you want to reduce the things that you need to get right. Mm -hmm. But other people in these in these small tournaments it's just about getting the right guy. The one right guy is going to get you there. You mm -hmm. don't need to get multiple things right because if if it's the Justin Fields 40-point game and you're one of the, the seven teams in the league in the competition to have Justin Fields, you're golden. You just needed right. the one player. Whereas in these big tournaments, the stacks are going to be really important. Sticking to the ADP is going to be really important. But letting the ADP value come to you. Like I talked about the Dallas Goddard falling 13 spots in ADP and it was a stack. That's like triple bonus. That's like a quadruple right. bonus because every, not ching, only ching, 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 all those boxes, it's, are checked. it's all the boxes are checked because yeah. not only do I have all of that, but I get essentially an extra bonus player from when Dallas Goddard was supposed to be drafted. I essentially swapped. Mm-hmm from where I could have taken Dallas Goddard and I got a better player instead because mm -hmm. for some reason that room just didn't want him. And that made my team unique. 
And in mm-hmm. an extremely large tournament, uniqueness plus stacks is extremely valuable. Yeah, right, right. Because now you're you, that uniqueness now. If in week 17, Hertz throws four touchdowns and two go to AJ Brown, one goes to Goddard, you're on smash mode. And a lot of people aren't going to particularly look to double stack, right? Is double stacking as popular as just your one, one, your quarterback and one guy, or do teams typically go for that double? Yeah, you can you can mega stack sometimes. It's Ooh, unique. I like the mega stack, Bradley. <laughs> Let's go. You can mega stack. It's just more risky because essentially mm-hmm. what you're saying is, uh, you know, it's very unlikely that all of those players go off. So, for instance, you draft Lamar Jackson and you draft Bateman and Beckham and Flowers all like because they're all right next to each other. It's very possible that you could have all three. Yeah. What my philosophy is, is typically I'll take two of them, just rotate between because I have no idea at this point, Maddie. Mm-hmm. I have no idea. I right. don't know which one is going Who's to be get the, the guy yeah. because an argument can be made for all three of them. I think very valid arguments can be made. So I don't have that pride. I don't know who's going to be the best. I, I think it's Beckham. Like my initial lean is Beckham because they paid him a lot of money. Historically commands massive target shares. Mm-hmm. Zay Flowers is probably going to spike near the end of the season. Rashad Bateman's dealt with the injuries, but so has Beckham. Like, but I think right. that, I don't have the pride of saying, you know what, Beckham is the guy. He's just more likely to be based on his profile. So when I'm going through, the reality is not all three of those are going to be hitting in a singular game. It's extremely unlikely anyways. But is it possible that two of them are? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, But maybe, maybe it's the two the one week and then a different two the next week. And then you you don't have them. You you you're left without that. See, I like I like the idea of when you're not sure, and if the ADP allows for it, and the draft room allows for it, grabbing both the options because then you don't have to make the choice because it is best ball, and now you have your 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 chance at either or or both. Well, one of the, one of my other favorite double taps is in round six, seven. I know it's a little earlier for Jackson Smith and Jigba, but I love clicking Tyler Lockett and JSN with Geno Smith later. Deontay Johnson can go round five. So you can go Johnson, Lockett, JSN, and then Geno Smith later. Or if you prefer, pick it even later. Even later. Like, yep. And you've got the bring back, or you've got that game environment mm-hmm. that could be a sneaky shootout. Right. Yeah, of, of course. So, yeah, I, I, that's a good approach. And I love the, the term double tap. It just, Bradley, it sounds so cool when you talk about mega steps and double tapping. When I leave this this office here after we record, my wife's like, what did you talk about in there? Because I'm like, listen, I got to get my mega stacks on. I'm going to be double tapping over here. You're going to have to let your boy have a few minutes. So. Who knows what comes out with? So it's also really nice to double tap at the turn. So if you're at a turn, it's a very easy spot for you to say, like, you know what, I'm going to I'm gonna turn it into a stack. Like you can just look and see. That's why, for instance, um Justin Fields ADP has dropped a little bit because DJ Moore's has dropped, and that's a very common four or five turn stack. So you you click DJ Moore, you then come back and click Justin Fields. Boom. There's your stack. Mm -hmm. So what one can cause the other to fall, because like you said, people are obviously hip to the, the the correlations week 17, the stacking, and that can cause that. So, all right. So we've covered now correlation stacking ADP. Now I want to talk about the team builds and kind of pick your brain on what you think is best. So, in your opinion, is there a particular team build that you believe works best? So the example being, you know, three quarterbacks, six, six, three, something like that. What's your favorite preferred uh, uh, build? Yeah, I, I talked with Todd about this on our best bell. Um, Todd Burrows, he's great. He does a lot of awesome work for sharp, uh, sharp football. And he and I talked about how there exists guardrails. Like you could have two or three quarterbacks two or three tight ends, mm-hmm. uh, five or six running backs, and then seven to nine wide receivers. But I think what's more important than just the numbers, because we can get hung up on the numbers, is positional capital. So, for instance, if you're drafting Travis Kelsey really early, it does not make sense for you to be taking Mark Andrews and Kyle Pitts later to get three tight ends. Uh, okay. It does not make sense for you to, if you're drafting Patrick Mahomes, it doesn't make sense for you to take three quarterbacks, like for you to take Mahomes and then Cousins and then another, like 
a Danny two Dimes, up. something too. Right. Yep. Yep. It doesn't, you've already given positional capital to that team. You're saying by drafting that player, I think he's the one. He's mm-hmm. the one who's going to be right for this particular team. And so if he's the right one, the other ones are not going to be the right ones. Mm-hmm. So consider the positional capital. Like if you're going early running back, like let's say you go Eckler and then Derek Henry rounds one and two, just or Eckler and Tony Pollard. Round one. Sure. Right. What you're, pick your poison. You've allotted, you've said these are the two running backs you're going to need. And then don't tap running back until much, 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 much later mm, because right. you have given positional capital to those elite running backs at the beginning. So consider not just the numbers, how the, how the roster construction ends up, but also what the, uh, what the positional capital is. Um, I will also offer that the, the person I brought on King Capital to the Best Bell channel this past week, he won the million dollars regular season tournament. He won a million dollars. It was awesome. I had him on. He talked about his team. He built a zero RB team, drafted Adams, then Kelsey, and then went four or three more wide receivers after that. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> he then tapped Jalen Hurts. But Joe Burrow fell 12 spots. And when we talk about unique builds, oh. the loss of or the, the positional capital loss was offset by the ADP fall of Joe Burrow. And it also made his team unique because if you remember last year, a lot of people were hung up. Am I going to draft Joe Burrow or Jalen Hurts? Mm-hmm. King Cap said both. And those were the only, well, he actually ended up drafting Davis Mills like last round. I I ragged on him a little bit because I was like, Burrow and Hurts are the players that are going to get you there. Yeah. And you don't need uh, any more quarterbacks with that. You don't need it. You don't need it. And he he went back and forth with me about it. But nevertheless, but the idea is that this positional capital matters. And if you give too much of it, you're losing an edge. If you're already saying, you know, Jalen Hurts is going to be the quarterback to get me to the promised land. Mm-hmm. And it was actually Jalen Hurts by week that Joe Burrow went off for 40 points. And that's what ended up like pushing him over the edge. So, I mean, was, you know, listen, value is value. We'll take that value. That's right. what we, in fantasy gamers, doesn't matter the format. We right. salivate over value. So, you know, this is something I'm going to take away from the, this conversation is, not one of these particular pillars are the end all be all. You should right. be fluid throughout, making sure you're keeping your eye on ADPs to get yes. that value, to make sure that your stacks make sense and that they're strong. And then also play off that week 17 correlation so that you can win the money at the end. But not one thing should dominate the rest. It should be this kind of spokes of a wheel here that you could kind of let rotate around and really maximize your teams by keeping all these things in your yes. mind and capitalizing on each of these at particular times when, like we said, the value presents itself. But now I'm curious for you, Bradley, give us your golden rule for competing in best ball contests. What is this? If you could put it, you know, this is your banner above your office. This is your flagship statement. What's the Bradley Stalder golden rule of best ball? Well, I I struggled with this because I, I looked at the show sheet and I'm like, I can answer all of these questions, Maddie, but this one is the toughest. And I decided if it's a golden rule, you shall. You shall draft the best stacks, value, construction, and players available. <laughs> Those are the four. Those are the four. You shall draft the best stacks, values, construction, and players available. That's, that's it. That's the best ball. Like, I, yeah. We haven't talked about player takes very much. I mean, I did say like it's difficult to get player takes correct, mm-hmm. but it's important for our viewers and listeners to make sure you are listening to the player takes here on the player profiler channel because a lot of great content is coming out, giving you insights into players. It is difficult for you to make good player takes when you're uninformed and player profiler is a great place for you to do that. Make sure you guys are hitting that subscribe button if you like the content. Yes, sir. I mean, I I knew you were pros pro, but holy cannoli, Bradley, you are 
you are a pros, 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 pro, pro right here with these plugs and this all this. And you know, it's funny is like, uh, you know, what I took from this conversation is, uh, you know, I had a lot more words and I said it a whole less, a lot less cooler than you did. But I, what I, I was kind of picking up what you were putting down. You know, we, we, it's all these things that go in together to make the, the golden rule. So uh, I have a few more questions for you. I definitely want to ask you. We'll be more rapid fire of, of a situation here because it is a player takey stuff. And I think that people want to pick your brain uh, about player stuff. But I, I, I would suggest, highly, highly suggest, if you are interested in best ball, whether you're new or you've been playing it for years, check out the best bell on Tuesday nights. Check out Bradley. He's having great guests on. And the 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 – topics the breakdowns you get in depth more more in depth with player takes and who you want here and there and where people can truly capitalize on your specific takes on these players so so definitely check that out first question i'm gonna ask you in rapid fire who are your must drafts in the early rounds i mean the early round wide receivers if you if you got an opportunity to draft okay. jefferson chase cup tyreek hill i mean at the back end of that round i'm drafting a lot of cd lamb and then coming back around with Amon Ross St. Brown. Those are mm-hmm. some major targets in the first round. Okay. Favorite late round sleepers for best ball contest. Who are these guys that you should grab late? I'm not going to give analysis. I'm just going to give names and then we'll move Let's on. Go. At quarter, these are ADP 170 or later per underdog fantasy. So Love that's it. the threshold. At quarterback, I give you three Brock Purdy, Sam Howell, and Ryan Tannehill. At running back, Jeff Wilson. Ty J Spears, Dwayne McBride, no matter what, baby. Uh, Dwayne McBride, no matter what. The little note card is out on your computer and everything. Dwayne I McBride. have it right here. Let's go. <laughs> yes, yes. It appeared. It appeared on the game plan. Uh, at wide receiver, Miko Hardman, Richie James, who is on the Kansas City I- Chiefs. Am big on Richie James. We are gonna we get we would screw the rapid fire real quick. He is one of four players last year, Bradley. I tweeted this out, and I, when I was doing some research in terms of when I was looking at the, I was doing some research, and I love playing the the data analysis to one player profile, and I was playing around on there, and I found out that I wanted to see who really attacks, who are these slot monsters. So I looked up two things: win the route win rate and fantasy points from the slot. Four players hit this criteria, a 45% or better route win rate and more than six points per game at the slot. Those four players were C.D. Lamb, Amon Ross St. Brown, oh. Chris Godwin, and Richie James. Richie freaking James. Let's go. Did Yeah, so I, I'm on. I'm with you on this. We can keep going, but I, yeah, I just I, – I'm, I'm in on Richie James too late too. I I – <laughs> my projections and look they're they're gonna change sure but uh richie james is my highest projected wide receiver target share ahead of tony ahead of uh ahead of sky Moore, ahead of mvs uh, uh sorry listeners i will be cutting this out because i want this for myself <laughs> <laughs> uh so okay richie james deontay hearty from the buffalo right that's from, from buffalo, buffalo. Yep. braxton barrios he, yeah, okay. Mm-hmm. Miami. Mm-hmm. Yep, makes sense. Mar- Marquise Goodwin of Cleveland. Mm, so is he the, your late week 17 correlation if you're running that 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 Browns Giants? Okay, okay. Marquise Goodwin, I'll, sure, I'll take one sentence and then we'll move on. Marquise Goodwin has three 20-point PPR games over the last two years. Two of them came last year. He is 33 years old, and he did that. Okay. <laughs> That's yeah, right. That right, right. That's pretty, pretty, pretty good. If you're talking spike weeks, Marquis Goodwin. Tight ends, Tyler Conklin. I think he has double digit touchdowns as a range of outcomes. Hunter mm-hmm. Henry. If you don't believe me on Hunter Henry, go listen to Man versus Machine. Man versus Machine last night. Billy mm-hmm. Muzio and I got into it about Hunter Henry. Go get Hunter Henry late. Trey McBride and Noah Fant. Oh, I love it. Love it. All right. Who's your QB one? We talked about the late guys. Like who's your QB one? Who's the guy you want at your QB position? If you could pick from anybody for ranks or projections, projections, we'll go projections. Projections is Justin Herbert. Bradley. We just became best friends. <laughs> we just became, I, I, his ceiling because, and I, I, I frequently uh, talk about his rushing ability last year, 147 yards. He's typically around 300. The ribs played a huge deal in that. 
he could be, and he had zero rushing touchdowns. He had four each of the last two, or four average for each of the last first two years. So massive, massive love that. But Next I have question. Jalen Hurts as my ranked number one quarterback. Right. Okay. That's fair. I think that, and I think that's a, a very smart distinction to make between the two because, uh, like you said, rankings and projections are two different beasts. You have to kind of catch up. Now, let's just say you have both that knowledge in your brain. Who are you taking? Who's Bradley Stalder taking? I've taken a lot of both of them. <laughs> <laughs> I've taken that's a lot of both of them. <laughs> That's that is the the volume that we talked about earlier. Yes, you can get yes. heavy, heavy, heavy in the players that you third. You, so you really just really to like. give you an instance, uh, a month ago, Theo Greminger and I drafted an FFPC best ball team. We got th- Jalen Hurts at the three point oh nine. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like <laughs> Jalen Hurts at the three point oh. Yeah, yeah, Kaching is straight up. So, uh, but I love Herbert when I'm avoiding quarterback early. Okay. This is the one I was most excited to ask you about because this, in my opinion, is the definition of Billy Muzio versus Bradley Stalder. This is the two guys going head to head. It is the reason for the thumbnail. Tony Pollard or Ramondre Stevenson. You're sitting there. You can only have one. Who are you taking? Easily Tony Pollard. It's not close. It's not particularly close. Ramondre Stevenson had to do all of what he did pretty much by himself. Damian Harris was a shell of himself with his injuries. No. Mm-hmm. Ezekiel Elliott. Let, let me let me reset for so you can make I this into yeah. so yeah. you can make this into the shorts. You can make this into the clips. <laughs> Let's make it happen, baby. Tony Pollard you are had, a pros pro. Tony Pollard had a number one and number two weekly finish. Ezekiel Elliott had 36 touches combined in those two games, where Tony Pollard finished the running back one and running back two overall in a week. You can double check it. Yeah, Tony Pollard can do it with another running back there. I am not afraid of Ezekiel Elliott resigning. I'm not afraid of Dalvin Cook. I am Mm -hmm. not afraid of whoever out there in the free agency world. Tony Pollard round two is just a smash. No matter where it's beautiful. It's upside. It's he can still pay off his ADP. The problem with drafting the Ecklers and the Christian McCaffrey's in round one is they need to hit running back one overall, or they are failing for you. Tony Pollard doesn't need that but he has the pathway to be the running back one overall. And it's cool. It's hip right now in the Twitter streets to say, oh, Tony Pollard can be the running back one overall. Let it go on the record. Go back to Mind Mansion. (laughs) I said it first. I said it first. I am the cool cat. Let's be, let's just put all chips on the table. I have found multiple people on the Twitter sphere afterwards. And I've just taken that video and just, replied or quote tweeted and said i have seen that a lot glad we're uh, on the same page and i don't think they're doing it neglectfully i don't think there's any Mm -hmm. malicious or malice or anything like that i think it's just that i was right first Listen, and the thing about Pollard, we've all loved Pollard for years, and now the fact that he's knocking on bell cow door, we're going to now all of a sudden say, let's get away from the 26-year-old because he's not 23? Uh Uh-uh. This is Tony Pollard's season for sure. I'm with you wholeheartedly as a Patriots fan, and I know a lot of people get slack for this. Okay, I've seen one season uh, since Corey Dillon where Belichick didn't have a committee. So – Listen, I get it. People are going to yell at me for this. I'm taking a I'm lot of pure strong is. late. I'm sprinkling in a yeah. bit of Kevin Harris. Like, I, I do think it's strong over Harris, but yeah. that's not a hill I'm willing to die on, you know? Mm-hmm. So, but I've taken some Ramondre when I've gone, let's say, Diggs, Allen, and then Ramondre because guess what? Ramondre is a pass catcher in. He will catch the ball in, in a shootout. Yep. In a shootout, so that is a comeback around or your bring back player in that in that game scenario. That makes perfect sense in that in that particular case. But we're talking about Bradley's pick. I'm with you. Let's go, Tony Pollard. Last question in a sentence or two. What's your tight end strategy in best ball? Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six words. Kelsey. 
big value or screw it. <laughs> <laughs> Clip it. That's the quote right there for the short. Clip it, baby. I love it. I love it. So for Kelsey, you're you're considering Kelsey in the first round. So that's the first one. Second is big value. I mean, you sure you can be stacking. You can be like, I like Mark Andrews in like a Miami correlation. I, I don't mind that we're stacking with Lamar Jackson. That's fine. Uh, but I'm focusing on Kelsey or letting tight ends fall to me. And you get the value. Or, I mean, I've done four tight end builds, just non tight ends for the first 14 rounds or 16 rounds. And then just tight end, tight end, tight end, tight end. At the all end, the guys you just mentioned, yeah, the Trey, Trey McBride, Noah Fant, get them, bam, bam, get all those guys. Conklin, Hunter Henry. Like, mm-hmm. once you get outside of the top 12 or top 15, they almost never hit without a touchdown. Yeah, so, right. So why don't you just take shots on guys who have historically caught touchdowns or been involved in their offense? So Trey McBride is going to be the starter. Noah Fant ran the most routes, caught the Mm -hmm. most passes out of Seattle. Hunter Henry had a 13% target share last year. John U. Smith is gone, and Mike Gesicki does not play the tight end position. Mm -mm. That's what Billy and I were arguing about for a long time last night, as doesn't Gesicki interfere with Hunter Henry? No, no, no. Gesicki's going to run wide receiver routes. And Tyler Mm -hmm. Conklin, Billy has called me out numerous times watching Conklin film as I was watching Conklin film late at night. He's like, Bradley, what are you watching? I'm like, Tyler Conklin film. Tyler- <laughs> <laughs> well, he needs to listen because you, like I said, you created Billy Muzio. Also, thanks for that, man. I mean, the monster that is Billy Muzio, you created that people. A lot of people out here are saying to themselves, listen, Bradley, if you didn't create the monster that is Billy Muzio, I'd have more money in my pocket. <laughs> well, speaking of, so this is a Robert Tunyon jersey behind me, courtesy yeah. of Billy Muzio, because a few during our first year as the fantasy football fanalist, it got to be about this time during the summer. And I told Billy, I said, hey, there's this tight end for Green Bay. His name is Robert Tunyon. <laughs> you should draft him. And Billy was like, Bradley was was weed just legalized in Michigan? Like, <laughs> what is happening? I, I know like, you don't no. have school right now. What are you partaking in? I, I, I know day? what you, I know, <laughs> I know you have a Green Bay Packers bias, but, and I was like, no, just trust me, like draft Tyler Con- or uh, draft Robert Tunyon because mm-hmm. he's the guy for, he's going to be the starting tight end for the Green Bay Packers. And Billy did. And Billy won a lot of money. A lot of money drafted Robert Tunyon, so he uh, he sent me that as a thanks. I mean, he's a class act. Billy Muzio is a class yeah, Billy act. Billy Muzio is uh, he's the best in the biz by far. Yeah, by yes. far. B- Billy Billy's the best. But you're the, I mean, you're the best. You're the man too, Bradley. And and <laughs> thank you so much for coming to the show. You're you know the best belt fantasy show on the Player Profile Network has been such a fantastic uh, addition to our family. Uh, you guys, you know, Mike and Adam with the deep end. You know, they just did an episode. Uh, you know, kind of just showing off the live event in Buffalo with the Scott. Oh, that Bristol. was so fun. I tuned so in for a couple fun. minutes. That was great. Oh yes, yeah. so I highly suggest if you haven't, uh, you know, checked out the deep end. Check out the latest episode. That's a perfect place to start. A lot of fun. Really gets the vibe of the Scott Fishbowl live event. So definitely check out the best, you know, uh, the deep end with, with Mike and Adam and obviously Best Bell Fantasy. And Bradley, you are the man. Thank you so much for coming on the game plan. The floor is yours. Plug everything you're working on where everyone can find your stuff. Yeah, I mean, look, you can follow me on Twitter at FF Stalder. You can follow me on threads at FF Stalder. That's a thing now. Look. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I post content there, sure. Oh, baby. Um, yeah, it's uh, I will be guesting this coming Wednesday on Man vs. Machine, so check that out. I will be, uh, once again, the machine, but Theo Greminger is stepping in for Billy Muzio next Ooh. week, and he will be the man. So right. man versus machine, two you guys need a referee. <laughs> let me know. <laughs> that's so good. That's so good. So that's going to be Wednesday. Tuesday is uh, is Best Bell YouTube mm-hmm. channel, uh, YouTube um, show on Player Profiler. Uh, Mike Leone from Establish the Run. I brought his name up Can't a couple times. Mm-hmm. He is going to talk to us about the Best Ball Manifesto. Some things that obviously I didn't bring up during the game plan. 
he is he's so sharp. He is just a sharp in this industry. And and we're so blessed to have uh, Mike Leone joining me for the Best Bell uh, podcast on Tuesday, 8 to 9 p.m. Eastern. Maddie, it's been such a pleasure chatting with you about best man. ball. And you are creating not just one beast, but in a couple of years, you might have created two beasts. Let's go. In the industry, as I am now going to be descendant of the Bradley Stalder tree, baby. Let's go. <laughs> so, everyone that's tuned in, thank you so much. That's going to be a wrap on this episode of the game plan. Bradley, you were just absolutely dynamite. Great guest. Absolutely. Anytime you want to come hang out, we will chat it up because you know, you're the man. That, this was too, too, too much fun. All you listeners out there, make sure to like the video, subscribe to the Player Profiler YouTube channel. Follow me on Twitter. I'm at Matty Kuhn. I will have to start a threads apparently because everyone else already is. Check us out on TikTok, Player Profiler, and Profiler underscore NFL. We're going to be beefing up uh, our content there, so you're definitely going to want to check all that out. And I can't recommend this enough. Get in the Player Profiler Discord because we're talking football all day, every day. Everyone out there listening, keep game planning, and I'll talk to you next week. Peace. Hey, you like that video? Be sure to subscribe and activate those alerts so you get notified as soon as new videos drop. And be sure to check out playerprofiler.com. We have all the tools for you to dominate every type of fantasy league. We have a draft kit, Dynasty Deluxe, Data Analysis, DFS Dominator, and don't forget the player rankings to rule them all.